That's a spirit <laughs> of exhaustion. Would you be able to rally your senses just to stay with me for, I mean, if we can do it right, if we could really stay together on this. Everybody, I, I, I'm a little, I'm walking a high wire here. I'm a little bit on a tightrope because the feedback I get always runs somewhere in between this. Pastor, that's a lot of meat. It's a lot to chew real fast and it gets slung at us real quick. And then on the other hand, I, I get, you know, listen, we want to hear from God. And I, I don't know exactly where that balance is. And over time, we're going to find it. But I will tell you this. We've gotten very little feedback from souls coming in. Most of them just feel the pull and come to the altar and begin a new life. And the Bible speaks of a time when people won't be able to endure sound doctrine. We're there. That's not a prophecy anymore. We're there. Nobody wants a doctrine, period, which is in and of itself a doctrine. Um, but it also speaks of a time when there would be a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. There's not a famine for speaking the word of the Lord. There's not even a famine for knowing the word of the Lord. But there is a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. You have to know where the breakdown in the supply chain is. You have to know where the breakdown in the economy is. Right now, we're looking at our economy a little bit sideways because if, if you've lived through one, two, or three of the cycles that the economy goes through, you already know you need to be bobbing and weaving right now. Because there's nothing that'll make you more uneasy if you've been through it before than the feeling of knowing that we got hit in the stomach, but we haven't passed out yet. You just, there's a, there's a little hesitation there where the rich know that it's all about to crumble. And real quick, they throw up a bunch of smoke screen and they make a bunch of moves to position themselves just right and dump all of the downside off on you and your poor little 401k. And those of us that have been through it before, we know when we've been hit and we haven't fallen yet. And we know that when the, the wild ride of the bull does not reflect the reality of the slaughterhouse, we know. We know something's going to give. And so there's this tension in the atmosphere. There's this general air of dis-ease among us. Everybody's on edge and everybody's defensive and everybody is kind of looking out for number one. And and we're coming off of three years where we didn't even sit in each other's living rooms or grab coffee across from each other. And somehow the enemy slipped in among us and made us suspicious of each other like we were each carriers of death. We started looking at each other like, we're all human beings, but humanity is a cohesive whole that rises or falls together. Civilization 
is an organism that lives or dies by its own merit. And the church is not only the last but the only hope for both humanity and civilization, but more fundamentally than that, for the entirety of all created order. And all of creation has seen the one-two punch of fear and the division and the anxiety and the hate that comes with it and unbelief that have swept our planet. And all of creation has seen that hit and is holding its breath. The angels have stopped what they're doing. The heavenly bodies are going sideways. The sun is suddenly spewing radioactive plasma at us, for lack of a better term. I don't know what you call it. Whatever it is, it's shutting down our, our communications. And, and the earth, the, the electromagnetic field is wobbling. And, and suddenly, 700 billionaires in the United States, and all of them seem to live in Hawaii and have bunkers that go five stories into the ground. What are they scared of? All creation is just looking at the church. The last time this happened, they were staring at a grave that had sat silent for three days. And all of creation is looking at the church just holding its breath, waiting to see the manifestation of the sons, the heirs, the children, the Elohim, the sons of God. Because if we're going to crawl up out of our grave, it's going to happen in the church house. If Jesus Christ is going to have co-heirs at the banquet with his father, it's going to happen at the church house. It's going to happen in the church it's going to happen amongst the church. But he knew that he had to keep us out of the church house because the new age will tell you that the kingdom is within you. But Jesus will tell you that the kingdom is within y'all. You got to come together. If we're going to manifest his name. And so... As I go to release you, I have to leave you, but I, I need you to stay with me for just these brief moments because I need you to leave here with this warning ringing in your ears. So I just need to, to, to tell you on your way out the door about the prophetic ministry of irritation because it's at work in this church body. And he's not going to back up off of it because he has an assignment for us. If disease is, con is a contagion, and if there's anything we've learned in the last few years, we've learned that disease is a contagion. But a lot of that story's been hidden from us, by the way, because anxiety inflammation, depression, that spreads just as quickly as any known pathogen. That spreads from person to person. What's wild about it is it spreads quicker when we're all in isolation. And the only thing we can share between us is our negative energy online and by text and You ever had that happen where you were so upset at somebody that the, the more you thought about it, the more you fixated on it, the more you just wanted to just knock them out? And, and the more you imagined the scenario, the angrier you became and the deeper that bitterness set in 
and, and, and it became an infatuation where you fetishized the idea of getting to say the thing. Getting to say the thing. It's going to feel so good to get to say the thing. And then you saw them. And if you could hold it together to stay mad long enough, you said the thing. And when you watched their face fall, it wasn't until you were standing eyeball to eyeball and you watched their face fall and you remembered who they are to you. And that actually you love them. And then when they hurt, you hurt. And that our destiny is bound together. And that if your ship sinks, my ship sinks. And if my boat rises, your boat rises. And all of a sudden, you don't want bad for them because you don't want bad for you. And they're a part of you. And now you're aware of that. But you stare into their eyes and you notice that the damage is already done. And now you're both standing on the bridges of your twin sinking ships, misty-eyed and wondering why neither one of us saw the iceberg just ahead of us. It's because the devil is a lie and he had you so fixated on what you can't stand about your brother and your sister that he was able to slip in among you and plant the landmine that was going to destroy your existence and you didn't even know he was there. So God gives us the prophetic ministry of irritation. Another way I could title it would just be the mantle, the mother, the parasite, and the pearl. The mantle, the mother, the parasite, and the pearl. The question to me that bounced in my head as we watched this presentation today and took in the spirit of what we were hearing and seeing is how did all that happened in our nation in the last 300, 400 years, whatever it's been. How did all of that happen in the first nation that was ever founded upon explicitly Christian principles, founded upon documents that, that, that state that the human condition is to be born with inexorable rights and privileges that are conferred upon us, not because of where we're born or what our name is or any of that, because we hated that. We had come through that with the royal family and, and the church, uh, the, the instituted church, and we hated all of that. We didn't want any part of that. How is it that, that we saw so much that we committed the highest of ideals to paper and we appended our signature to them so, so, uh, uh, so heartily did we sign our name to them that, that the, the scrawled signature of one of those signers became our culture's way of referring to the autograph. You give it your John Hancock. How in that environment did things like like human trafficking that that's going on today and chattel slavery and 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 the the uh, Jim Crow laws and how did all of that happen in in a Christian nation in in a nation that we insist honored God so deeply and and I don't know what your answer is and I don't know how you think about it but I came to tell you today that I know of no other place to lay the fault for that than right here at the pulpit because I'm going to tell you something today we can say it was a different time we can say things were not so but my man Spurgeon was over in London crying out in the night saying if I come to take the Lord supper and see beside me someone who owns slaves I will have to withdraw from the Lord's supper because what fellowship hath light with darkness and what communion hath the Holy Ghost with the table of demons I can't be a part of that 
So don't tell me it was a different time. It was a different time. I understand that there were different predominant spirits of the age, but all of them were sent by lust and greed and envy and, and, and all of the same deadly sins and fundamental flaws that power every age. Every spirit of the age is just a messenger of the fundamental spirit that has this planet under its thumb. So it's the fault of the pulpit. Because the Lord looked and he saw no man that would stand in the gap. It's intimidating to stare the spirit of the age in the eye and say what thus saith the word of the Lord. And it's exhausting because you are constantly reassured that we just want to hear from God, that we just want a word from God. But no, you really don't. You want a word from God in the exact time frame that you like it. You want the preacher to use the tone of voice that you're most uh, comfortable with. You'd like him to read from the translation that you happen to hold dearest. You would like the preacher to, to enjoy the same kind of music you do, and you don't like the temperature the way that it is, and the time of the service is not very good for any of us. I'm not complaining here. I'm telling you the truth. I'm can you honestly say I'm not telling you the truth? You, you, you don't want it to be too this way and you want it to be just enough that way and nothing is a greater hindrance to the glory of the latter house than somebody who's so convinced that they know how God does his business because they saw the glory of the former house that every time the latter house begins to show forth the, the dimensions of what God is beginning to do and a shout of joy Joy goes up from the generation to come. There's another cry of dismay that goes up from all of those who remember how it used to be back in the good old days uh, when blood ran in the streets of our nation uh, and oppression had it, its bastion fully in, in, enmeshed in the church of the living God. And I liked it better back then. I was more comfortable that way. We didn't have to face down our demons because they didn't come talk to I'm talking about the prophetic ministry of irritation. God give us pulpits that refuse to flinch in the face of the angry huddled masses because I came to tell you today I want you to like me but I don't need you to like me. I want you to love me but I have to love you because when I look at you I see the image of God staring back at me from underneath a canvas that is so caked in the denigration of society and all of the filth that this world has placed upon it that I owe it to you uh, to get in your face and say I don't think you remember who you are because I don't think you remember whose you are. I don't think you understand anymore what you were created to be because you've forgotten the face of your creator when you can't see it in your brother and your sister. 1 Kings 18 says it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Everybody say Elijah. Remember, if you want to get out of here at a reasonable time, we're going to stick together. In the third year, the third year of what? The third year of a famine. That's what Elijah prayed because the house of Ahab, which the Bible says, there was no other house like unto it. Brother Ben, can I get a water? There was no other house like the house of Ahab. No other king that did evil in the eyes of God as far as the king of Israel than Ahab because his wife Jezebel coached him in how to do it. She was the best in the business. And Jezebel wasn't really the problem. Thank you so much. Jezebel wasn't really the problem. The problem was Ahab's alliance with Jezebel's father. Can I hear an amen? Because she was just a Phoenician girl. But Ahab's the one that decided he needed that alliance. And so she got in his ear and she began to tell him how the gods of this world do their business. And so Elijah calls for a famine. And in the third year of the famine, the word of the Lord comes to him. First Kings 18 and 1 says, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. 
and there was a, a severe famine in Samaria. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? See, it's not going to take me long to finish this because this is the only point I've got today. The prophetic ministry of irritation. The mantle, the mother, the parasite, and the pearl. Is that you, O troubler of Israel? That word troubler means to royal. And I thought, what does royal mean? It means to royal water. I thought, what does royal mean? I've heard it. I think I would know it if I saw it. But I went and looked it up, and it means to make muddy by stirring up the sediment. To make muddy by stirring up the sediment. To annoy. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Is that you, preacher man? How come when I'm chilling in the clear blue water and I've all, I found my fishing hole, I got my keystone light right here and I got my pole right there and, 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 and the, 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 the vibe on the radio is just hitting just right and I've just relaxed in and I can see every pebble on the bottom and then you got to show up churning up the bottom and making us look at all that mud and that mess that we already agreed we were just going to leave it lie because we don't like it. Is that you, old troubler of Israel? And it reminds me of how Herod's wife felt about John the Baptist, a prisoner of purpose, the one who couldn't just go to the birthday party and, and watch and perform for, for Herod. Herod liked John. Herod liked to hear John preach. Herod felt good when John preached. Herod kind of knew where John was coming from. He liked to think there was a kinship there, but Herod has, also had to live uh, with with his wife and he didn't like that she didn't like that John didn't like that their marriage was unauthorized and that they had no business being that way and and so she worked around like, like old Jezebel of old and got in a daughter's ear and at a birthday party his daughter asked Herod's daughter asked for the head of John the Baptist the troubler the troubler Jesus called him Elijah the prophet the troubler of Israel and, 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 and there he is in prison now. And John, John knows he's going to lose his head. And, and last week I told you he sends his disciples in kind of a surreptitious handoff to Jesus. Go ask him, are you the one or do we look for another? And Jesus kind of low-key gives them a, a, an ordination. He says, go tell John what you saw here. The lame leap, the dumb speak. And, and then Jesus troubled in his spirit as the disciples of John go to leave thinking about where John is sitting and what it means about where the, the mission has come to, turns around to the people and says, what did you come here to see anyway? What show did you come here to catch? Because I came to tell you today in my last moments before you that truth demands the price of admission every time a prophet comes to die. And so he said, I want to know what you came out to see. Did you come out to see something ordinary? A reed shaking in the wind? A bamboo rustled by the breeze? Did you come out to see something odd? The greatest, did, did, did you come out to see the, the, the great man in his great robes and, and, and a preacher in a designer suit, if you will? Is that what you came here to see? Because John was famous for not dressing like church people thought that preachers ought to dress. And he, he said, uh, oh, did you? Maybe. Come here to see a man sent from God. Because if you did, I've got news for you. John's not just a prophet. He's the greatest man that's ever been born to women on this earth. But he's going to be overshadowed by the least of them that are reborn in the kingdom of God. And then Matthew's account inserts a little warning. He says to them, because from the days of John the Baptist until now... The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And we have wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with that because we have not clearly understood the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and they're not at all the same. And once you understand that the kingdom of heaven 
is a way of the ancient world of saying the kingdom down below that is ruled by the powers up above. The kingdom on this planet that is ruled from the second heaven where Mars and Jupiter have their throne, where Zeus has some authority still because it has been granted to him, where the prince of the power of the air still gets to maneuver himself from time to time. And, and so he said, I got news for you. I need you to understand something. John came in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, the hearts of the fathers back to the children, and to declare to the people of God that it's time to make way for the kingdom of God. And because John has been sent to you, you are now responsible for understanding the moment that we are in. And because you are now responsible and the gods of this world are now responsible, God has opened the gates and removed his hand of protection so every kingdom that is established in this world is subject to being taken over. Jesus said to them, John came in the spirit of Elijah to tell Ahab and his harlot wife that your kingdom is up for grabs. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Jesus was warning them, don't think that just because you have a Jewish last name, don't think that just because you live in this land don't think that I won't give you over to another authority because you're responsible because, because Elijah came and, and then he he just says you don't like John either do you Bible says when all the people heard him even the tax collectors justified God. Why? Because they'd been baptized with the baptism of John. What does that mean? John told them, you got to repent. You got to turn from your ways. You got to do things his way. And because they went through that, they heard the truth. And they said, yeah, that sounds right. God is true. And I am a liar. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, the religious system, they rejected the will of God for themselves. Why? Because they hadn't repented. They hadn't been baptized by John. And then Jesus said, to what then shall I liken the people of this generation and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We mourned for you and you didn't weep. He said, John came fasting, praying. He didn't drink anything. You said he has a demon. I came eating my meals with you, and you said, hey, he's a, he's a glutton and a wine bibber. He's got friends that are no good for anything. He said, but wisdom always shows up in what is produced from its house. My brother conducts an orchestra. If you've ever been to a concert where an orchestra plays, at the beginning of the concert, just before the music begins, the concert master will stand and on the violin will bow one long note. It's the concert master's responsibility to be dead on, completely in tune, because then the conductor will lift their baton and they will count for the orchestra to join Every instrument has to, even the timpani, even the drum has to join in and show that I'm running on exactly the same frequency as the concert master because the concert cannot begin until the frequency has been tuned in to the will of the composer. And if there's a clash, the conductor will always assume the concert master's correctness. The concert master can stand against the entirety of the rest of the orchestra. The concert master will never, the, the, the conductor will never hold the concert master accountable for the clash in the notes. He will always scan and listen and, and hold the, the, the one that's out of alignment with that 
frequency responsible for the clash. Clarinets, you need to go up half a, a, a step. Oboes, woodwinds, drums, cello. You got to get on this. Well, I tuned to the machine. I think the concert master is wrong. Here's what about that. That will start debates, and debates will keep us from having a concert. But if we'll all just join the concert master in their pocket, then everything's going to be okay because love covers a multitude of sins. So just slide on here into the frequency that's been played for you. The prophetic ministry of irritation. I'm fully coming to the point of it now. King Jehoshaphat, remember him? Send up Judah, righteous king of Judah. He also made an alliance by marriage with Ahab, the one that's got a weird relationship with prophets because he's got some bedfellows that don't enjoy the word. And so... After a while, Jehoshaphat goes down to visit his father-in-law at headquarters in Samaria. And Ahab kills sheep and oxen in abundance and receives them so well. And, and when he's just feeling full up and enjoying their relationship, Ahab says, Hey, Jehoshaphat, will you go up with me to Ramoth Gilead? I, I've got a bone to pick with my neighbor. Will you go out and have my back? And Ahab asked Jehoshaphat the question. No sooner did he ask than Jehoshaphat said, hey, listen, I am as you are. We're, we're kin now. My people is your people. I'll be with you in this war, but just, just one thing. The Bible says, and also Jehoshaphat said, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Be careful. Be careful. When you're salt and light, God will send you into some potentially compromising situations where others have lost their soul and lost their way before. If the salt loses its savor, it's no good. If the light gets hid, it's no good. You can go bravely into that situation and don't mind what religious people have to say to you, but never shrink back from saying the thing that God sent you to say. So Jehoshaphat says we need to inquire of the Lord. And so Ahab gathers the prophets together for 400 men. They're spoiled for choice. What preacher do you want? You want TBN? You want you want uh, 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 the 700 Club? You you want uh, what? I, I don't know. I forget them. I never watch them. So I don't. I, but you, which one you want? Or you want? Let's let's go through YouTubers. Who do you want to hear from today? I got 400 lined up. I got a full playlist. There's plenty of word from God. You want a word from God? And so he asked them. Ahab says to the 400 prophets shall we go to war or shall we refrain and and they all said go up for God will deliver it into the king's hand can I get a shout today from somebody who likes a good word from the Lord somebody who likes to hear be strong and of good cheer don't 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 be afraid the Lord fights your battle stand still no weapon formed against you shall prosper God says this is your season for I know the plans I have for you plans to prosper you and not to harm you. So the king of Israel says to, to, to Jehosh oh, so Jehoshaphat says after the 400 all agree together about this good word for 2024 that it's just going to be so great and, 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 and go up for God's going to deliver him to the king's hand and Jehoshaphat says isn't there just one more? Isn't there even one more prophet of the Lord left here that we may inquire of him. Can I tell you what's happening right here? What's happening right here is that Jehoshaphat is the concert master. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Jehoshaphat has been sent into this situation as the concert master, and he's got a note, a clear note playing in his soul. He didn't think about lunch while the preacher was preaching. He didn't think about uh, after school and, and video games while he was studying Torah. He didn't think about where he was going to go on, on date night with his wife while, while they were at pr first Monday prayer. He's got a clear note inside his soul and he's t 
tuned up to the frequency of the king and his kingdom and something isn't quite right and Jehoshaphat is not about to ask anybody to please change their tune. He's not about to tune himself down to the orchestra. The orchestra is many in number but he hasn't heard the note he's listening for yet and so Jehoshaphat says there's got to be just one more. There's got to be one more. God never leaves us without a seed and so the king says there is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord but I hate him. I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me but always evil and Jehoshaphat said don't talk like that father-in-law and so father-in-law said bring Micaiah in here and so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat robed themselves in their kingly robes and they sit down in a public place of honor and while they're waiting for Micaiah to come the the prophets begin to dance before them and and perform for them is very good programming one of them grabs two horns and puts it on his helmet and says with these two horns uh, you shall gore your enemies in the name of the Lord and oh it's good TV it's real good and and they're right there in front of the king so of course they're going to stay away from the sensitive stuff they're going to stick with the stuff that plays well and puts a tithe in the coffer so The messenger who went to call Micaiah said, hey, man, you got to come prophesy to the kings. Let's get ready to worship our way out. Just carry this word with us. Ask the Lord to take it all the way in. Do the deep work. Messenger says, come on, Micaiah, we got to go prophesy to these two kings. But listen, 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 listen. This church is in kind of a sensitive moment. They've been through a lot. Ahab, feeling kind of insecure. If you think about it, he's trying to do a good thing. He's just trying to defend Israel. Isn't that what he's ordained to do? So listen, he's kind of feeling some kind of way. A little insecure. And he's got his son-in-law here. And you know Jehoshaphat. It's kind of judgy for a guy with just one little old podunk tribe. <clears throat> so listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. I like a good word of encouragement, don't you? I like to go to church on Sunday morning, come away encouraged. Our poor youth are sitting over there. We didn't let them go out today. They like a good word of encouragement. They're going through a lot. A lot of y'all could have been at church somewhere else today and heard a good word of encouragement that lines up with the word of God. Nothing wrong with it. But for whatever reason, by the divine will of God orchestrated from the foundation of the world, you're sitting in this room today. I have no idea what the future holds, but I know you're here right now, hoping that this is where we end. Micaiah says, look, if God's still alive, whatever he says, that's what I'm going to say comes to the king king says Micaiah and you you could see it right now couldn't you because you, you some of you you've been around church long enough you've been in that deacons meeting you've been in that Micaiah shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead or should I stay home And he said, go and prosper. Live your best life now. They shall be delivered into your hand. Turns out even old Ahab 
knew when an instrument's out of tune, when push comes to shove. Because Ahab says, all right, how many times I got to make you swear you're going to tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Basically, what he said, I don't, I don't, I don't believe you because I kind of know I'm not supposed to be doing this. And then Micaiah says, well, I saw all Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said to me, tell them to go home to their tents in peace. Because I wasn't about this battle to begin with. And there's nobody left to fight for. And the king of Israel turns to his son-in-law and says, what I tell you, he never prophesies any good concerning me. He died that day, but he couldn't say God didn't warn him. I'm talking about the ministry, the prophetic ministry of irritation. I don't like that assignment. If you want me to stop irritating you, you got a couple of options. You can leave. Nobody's going to judge you. If they talk about you, they're going to have me to deal with because that's not our place. We're not about that. And it's not the will of God, neither is it my intention or Pastor Brooks' intention that we carry that culture another day into the future. You gotta go, you gotta go. If you don't feel released from here and you're tired of being irritated. You could say like the old timers would say, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way thou art the potter I am the clay mold me and make me what does it say there? You hear how that's in line? That's on the frequency. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use. I think it was St. Francis of Assisi, somebody like that. That said, I have been all things unholy. And if God can use me, he can use anyone. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. And love that soul through me. Whew. See, we wanted to just give you the presentation and send you home. But the concert master keeps saying, mm, we're a little flat. I'm trying to play Austin home to Jesus, but I need my orchestra in tune. I'm trying to play your baby out of addiction, but I I need my orchestra in unity. You understand that these babies in middle school are having their 
egos and their sense of self and worth shattered by TikTok culture, weeping into their pillows at night because where God put a gorgeous, perfect, perfectly proportioned human body, they see nothing. But where is the filter? Where's that filter that makes everything look so good? I came to tell you something, that filter only exists in the mind of the liar. And the liar came not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. Our babies are lying in bed at night worrying about whether they're a boy or a girl, or, or maybe they are gender non-conforming and getting driven to the point of, of, of suicidal ideations. And we're still back here putting our head in the sand, trying to pretend that that's just a problem for liberals. And that's just a problem for those people across the street. And I came to tell you something God didn't send me to yell at the at the at the homeless guy across the street beating on a dumpster about being out of alignment God sent me as a prophetic ministry of irritation to the orchestra to say come on up a little higher play the right note violins quit talking about the oboes oboes quit talking about the triangle triangle quit envying the timpani timpani quit overpowering the violin trumpets raise your voice cry aloud and spare not cry aloud and tell my people stand with me please where were the preachers in America where were the preachers Standing in the rooms while human souls were auctioned off. Where were the preachers? Where were the preachers? When they made merchandise of human beings. Where were the preachers? When the church stood by in silent assent because the tithe depended on the continuation of the slave trade. Where were the preachers? They are the same place today as they were then. Buried so deep into the, the, the business of, of pleasing people that they entirely lost sight of the fact that they were once a man sent from God. A voice crying in the wilderness. I'll tell you where the preachers were. The preachers were out in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights while the prophet liars held court in the pulpits of America. I'll tell you where the preachers were. The preachers were in the slave churches looking out across the congregation saying this world got nothing for you. Keep your eye on the prize. You got golden slippers coming. Forget about silver spoons. I'll tell you where the preachers were. The preachers were saying silver and gold. Have I none? I'm under the slave master's whip too, but I came to tell you today that I serve somebody who will heal you, deliver you, set you free. And the black church prayed the yoke of oppression off of America. The black church sang the chains off of America. And then as soon as we became physically free, the liar, the one that comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't you ever let anybody tell you it's the white man's religion. It might be the white man's religion here, but it isn't the white man's faith. It's always been according to those that believe on him who sent the one that came in the name of the Lord. But as soon as they broke physically free, he sent out wolves in sheep's clothing among them to say, hey, come up on this high mountain with me. Let me show you now that you're free. 
I know we said something about 40 acres and a mule. Forget 40 acres and a mule. I'm going to show you something. If you just sell out a little bit, I'll give you riches you can't listen. You won't be able to get them to stop mailing you checks. Just tell them this olive oil came from the Holy Land, and it's been blessed seven times. And if they'll sow a $2,024 seed, the Lord's going to give them a 2000 and 24 percent and everybody said okay put the shackles back on but I came to tell you today it's not because there aren't preachers it's not because there aren't prophets it's just that you're not going to find them where the crowds have gone to. You're not going to find them where there's finery. And, and you're, you're going to find them out in the wilderness. You're going to find them battling the devil head first because he knows he's coming for your babies. And he won't quit resisting them until he flees. So, thank you. Because we called you slaves. But you prayed us out of bondage into his marvelous light. And God forgive us because our culture turned around and said, Fine! If we can't keep you in the slave quarters, let's shove you down to the bottom of the middle class abyss and stand on your shoulders and repeat the cycle and we'll lure you with greed. And the gospel still stands where we left the gospel, bleeding out on a hill, paying the price for all of humankind to be set free. I need somebody, somebody who's got 45 seconds to spare just to lift your voice and begin to let that prophetic utterance begin to come out of you. Oh, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. I'm talking about the oyster lying in the seabed, feeling the covering of the mantle. That's what they call it when a wound slips in and a parasite comes through and it gnaws away. And as it gnaws away, away at the flesh of the oyster the mantle begins to secrete a sweet substance called mother of pearl and as the mantle layers the mother of pearl over that parasite it kills the parasite and then it makes a nucleus out of it and then it forms a pearl out of it and I came to tell somebody today there's still riches in the mantle there's still plenty of mother in the pearl but what we've got to do is lean in to the prophetic ministry of irritation and stop trying to get away from the voice crying in the wilderness because the kingdoms of this world are done for and if black history speaks one thing to the American church today it speaks this Never let the enemy trick you into thinking you're going to find what you're looking for in this present life. You're going to lose it either way. Give it up for Jesus and watch what he does with it. I love you. The Lord loves you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, my goodness, there's people down here that wear lanyards. Or if you're in the feed, say, I, I want to give my life. But come down here and say, will you pray with me? I'm going I, I, I to be a part of the orchestra, but I don't know the frequency. Come on, come on. I want to be in the orchestra, but I don't have an instrument. Yeah, you do. Come on, come on, come on. We'll show it to you. Oh, you'll give me one? No, he already gave you one. We'll help you find it in the closet where the enemy hid it from you. Saint of God, before you leave, could you spare five minutes? Before you leave, could you spare five minutes? You can do it right where you are. You can come down here. You can do it right where you are. But for those 12 of you that remained and those of you that are in the feed, could you spare five minutes? to say, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. I listen to me, listen to me, I know. I know church has been going so long, for so long. 
I'm talking about the prophetic ministry of irritation. Don't you think for one minute that God doesn't see how it gets under your skin. And the quicker you learn to stop gossiping, the quicker he's going to bring it to a halt. The quicker you learn to stop grumbling and complaining, the quicker he's going to finish this work. But I came to tell you, it's time to run for the irritant and say, give me more of that until Christ is formed in me. Not my will but thine be done couldn't you watch and pray with me one hour don't you want breakthrough in your family don't you want the freedom it was for freedom that Christ Jesus set us free take a couple minutes before you leave sign up for active duty tell him about first Monday tell him about first Monday may I gently suggest that other than having been providentially hindered if you haven't been at First Monday and you've been here long enough to hear the invitation and miss it, would you talk to him about that? And just commit to him. First Monday and First Wednesday are going to become a part of my spiritual practice. A day a week of fasting is now part of my spiritual practice. Reading the weekly portion from the church, that's a part of my spiritual practice. Jesus, irritate me. Irritate the mess out of me and irritate your image into me. I love you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Go, be blessed, prosper. But before you go, make sure you let him know, I want you to drive that irritant all the way in and draw out of me what you have put in me for this season because it's not over until he takes you home. I love you. God bless you.